Okay, so let's just make sure we are all in the right place, including me. Oh, so this is of course made of campus and I think the it's close listed, but the easy number should be that one. Okay. Uh, so just a few, a few logistical stuff. So you know the class is so you know, you know by now. Should have had in to be able to log into the class website. So the most important thing of course is the handout. Um, you should definitely look at the handout again because you know, I, I will not be here the week of Thanksgiving or the other towns. I've moved those two lectures to two Fridays and the close Friday lecture will not be held here, they'll be held somewhere else. Okay, so just go to the handout, I think it's on the second page. So there are two pages of the handout. The second page has the Thanksgiving schedule, so please take a look at that. There'll be two lectures over there. Okay, so the website also has the course notes. You can definitely download the but most of the homework are synchronized with the course notes. Okay, so if you want a textbook, you don't need a textbook for this class, but if somebody needs a textbook, with an uh, introduction to the course, and I list a bunch of books that you could potentially use. Uh, formally, we ask that you use Conrad's book, that's sort of like the default textbook, unless you want to follow one of the other suggestions. So this is called uh, Medical Analysis and Applied Legal Analysis. Okay, I think the book is reasonably prior because it's from Sam and comes with a PDF uh, version of it too. But I think this is a good book for this class. Uh, you can also use Frank's book. If you have your a favorite undergraduate book that you used before, then that's fine. You can use other books. This is at a better, at a more reasonable level of maturity for this one. So I would recommend this one. So of course you don't need a book at all if you don't want to. So that's fine too. Okay, so then the last thing of course is, um, yeah, there's no midterm or final result take home. So there is, the focus class is, is, is maybe a little bit different from what you're used to. So I just go to the policy. So as you can see, you know, there are people from like four or five departments in this room right now. So people come with very different backgrounds to this class. Right? And you're all graduate students. So when I grade this class, I'm not at all grading on your ability to actually solve okay, this class is not meant for uh, the difficulty this class is way too high for you to be able to actually solve the problem that you need. So the class is more like you know like master class in ballet or you know because it's just you're supposed to be doing a lot of mathematics. You, you do a lot of mathematics you get an A. So I class in two A's to the B that's it. So what I can put in like you know half Class is pure graded on the homework is graded on okay. so you have to grade yourself and you grade yourself on zero, one and two. Okay, so this two means that either you solve the problem, maybe it took only two seconds, that's fine, but you solve the problem, that's fine. Okay, so you did everything perfectly. One means you put in a lot of effort into the class, into that problem. So each problem in the homework is graded by yourself. So there are ten problems to gain all ten problems. Uh, there are some seats out here too, maybe in this person the class if you want to find the place. Uh, zero means you didn't attend the problem. Okay, so to get an A in the class, you just have to average the one. Okay, is that clear? All right, I mean, I'm only counting your effort you put into this class, not whether you actually solve the problems or not. And I use the same policy all the way through to the final. Okay, in the final also, you grade yourself like this. Two means you did it, you got the answer perfectly. One means you put a lot of time and you think your effort is good enough for an A and then that's then you give yourself. Okay, then there'll be a grade in this class and you just cross check a few problems. Just make sure you're all being honest. Is that okay? All right, so I'm sure hopefully we'll not talk about grades again in this class. Yeah, perfect. Now, the homework will be in two tracks, but there are people here who may not have done linear algebra in a while. And there are also varying uh, degrees of mathematical maturity among you. The goal of this class is that eventually all of you will be mathematically mature enough that when you're doing a PhD thesis, you're feeling comfortable proving things mathematically. So sort of to get you to that level is the goal of this class, right? But you're all starting off at different levels when you come into the class. So there's two tracks. And you should self-select for every problem, there'll be two tracks. There'll be track one and then track two, right? The track one, of course, will be the easier track, which I expect all of you to be able to do. 
So track one pretty much will consist of saying, okay, take the class nodes, and the class nodes will be the proofs are broken down into smaller sub problems. The rest of that exercise, and I'll say, okay, G, let's tend to the rest of the class. The template is good, I can split all up. Okay, that's track one. Of course, you know, most of you should be able to do this yourself. So, really, track one is of like uh, irrelevant in a way. Right? If you really want to do that one in page 11, then you really you should try to do track two. Okay, so track two will be, of course, you know, simply harder. I mean, there will be no comparison between track two and track one in general. You should consider it lucky if you can just try all parts of track two by the end of the week. Every week there will be a homework set. So, that will be the amount of time you get. Okay, you should not feel bad if you find that you look so fast and you don't have a Okay, it's perfectly fine, but the goal here is not actually solve the problem. The goal is how much time you spend doing that habit. Hopefully, through the effort, you'll get significantly better by the class is over. Alright, so again, I want to emphasize, okay, this, this class is not about moving and actually solve the problem that I give you in the homework. Alright, you just want to be better at mathematics, you want to be better at mathematics, you actually do mathematics. Alright? You can any expert you can already do in these two, but you should at least one of them. Okay? Of course, if you're going to try to do track two, make sure that you can actually do track one before you jump to track two. Okay, that goes last side. Uh, sometimes people just jump on the track two, and then if I ask them to try some track one from the same problem, then probably not a good idea to be doing track two yet. Okay? But eventually, at least all machine learning people and electrical engineers should be doing track two, not track one. And definitely anybody from the main department should be there at track two. Okay, so if you cannot do track two, you cannot do function analysis. So you should, you know, fool yourself to do this and then this will work it. If you're not All right. All right. And it sounds like I don't care. You can do track two one week and track one next one one next week and so on and so forth. Then it's up to you. Just manage your own time the best you can. All right. So next, well, for people who are going to do track two or track one or mathematics in general, especially for engineers who are not doing so very real mathematics, let's get what. Do mathematics, okay? So there are couple, it's very easy to acquire that math habit in mathematics, right? Just like when you do painting or ballet, it's easy to acquire that habit. So same thing with mathematics. Okay? First thing is don't read mathematics, okay? Don't read your textbook. It's probably the worst way to learn mathematics to read something about it. Like when you don't learn to do ballet, you read a book about ballet, right? The best way to do ballet or mathematics is to do it. So you just take it on and start solving it. If you find you're completely stuck, there's probably something in the notes or in the, in the textbook that will help you. Okay, so for example, you read a theorem in a math book, right? The only thing you do is to read the proof. After you read the theorem, you try to prove it to yourself. Most theorems in mathematics are fairly easy to prove. Okay, if it's not easy to prove, there'll be a name attached. It's like, you know, it's a Cauchy Schwartz in the quality. So there's a name attached to the theorem, then what you say that the theorem could be hard to, it could have a name for two reasons. You the proof, and the theorem is hard to find, you don't know which it was. So there's a name attached to the theorem, say, I'll give Michael 20 minutes, right? And for 20 minutes, you try to do the proof. If you completely start, you read the first line of the proof, and then you try that. Okay, if you ever read a proof, it's pretty much, you know, some voice that out. Okay, second thing in mathematics is, with the children, you should start proving the simpler problems. Okay, so if I'm going to talk about matrices, I think, with matrices, I associate. Okay, you should prove it. Okay, very, very essential. Because if, even though it's a very tedious proof, if you can't do a simple proof, then when you go to the hard proof, so you want to know when, uh, the simple part of the earlier proof is being reused inside this proof. Okay, so you should make sure you can do the simple proofs first. Right, the uh, second thing is that even if you have to read a book, try not to memorize that book. Okay, so many times when I've seen people doing mathematics, it's oh yeah, I don't know that theorem from the top right hand side of page 195 in this particular book, I'm going to read it over here, right? That's a bad habit in mathematics. Okay, the right way to mathematics always works things out for yourself. Even if it's a well known theorem, the theorem itself is irrelevant, but the way we prove the thing is what matters, is what counts as the way we do mathematics. Okay, so apparently doing the derivation yourself, that referring to a book, is how you become a good mathematician. Right, and you should, even though the beginning is like pulling teeth, that I must improve everything, you should eventually you will see that you become much, much faster if you take the pain now. You're constantly looking up proofs, and looking up content, and constantly going to the internet, looking at Wikipedia, you will always be very shy about using mathematical history. You never feel you've mastered it. Okay, so the most important thing, don't read it, don't look it up. 
Okay, Google is not your friend in this class. You do just need to like this video. But the best thing is to just ask me for a hint. Usually, we talk to me for two months, I can tell you exactly where you are stuck. I'll give you a tiny hint and you go over it yourself. Okay? It's the best way to do it. So, again, like, like that's why I said, man, the, the book is not important. It's just going to take book hurts. If you spend a whole time reading the book and trying to understand stuff, you feel that's what there's no such thing as understanding. Okay? So, you should really, really try to just do it yourself. I can't emphasize that enough. Okay, so now what is this class about? So in this class, we're talking about matrix analysis. This class used to be a competition oriented class, but what we found with the students are having a hard time in not only really understanding how the algorithm works, but proving that it works in fire physics and arithmetic. So over time, I've dropped the fire physics and arithmetic from this class. So we used to have Golub and Randall as a textbook. So we're finding it too difficult, so we dropped that. So now what we do instead is that I make all the proofs constructed. So in Principle, you can, every proof corresponds to the algorithm that you can code up in MATLAB or whatever language yourself, and you can do it uh, actually running uh, uh, in your computer. Right? And this equivalence between proofs and programs is very, very important. Okay? In particular, especially for engineers, there's a tendency to think that mathematics is about some very esoteric stuff. Okay? But it's very important that in this class, you realize that mathematics has only like two things in it. Okay? One is the integers. Okay, so whenever in this class, we only depend upon two things. That we want to know what integers, like this awesome integers mean, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And that basic fact about integers is assumed to be known and not part of our, you know, we just assume that you and I know what it means to add 2 plus 3. We understand the basic Roman numeral notation, or we can understand what it means to add integers. Okay, that's all. Everything else has to be defined in terms of this. All of mathematics, so I'm talking about differential geometry or topology or group theory, cannot extend a set of truths. Okay, so it's a very, very tiny universe. We have integers in it, and the notion of ordinary integers, which is Hang out. I cannot add any more truths to this world. I can rename things. I can say, you know, this pair of integers is now the fraction. 2 over 3, I can give it a new name to a group of integers, but I cannot add any more truths to this. Okay, it's very important, no matter what mathematics I'm doing, it's all down to integers and adding integers. Okay, so when you say that, that's why reading mathematics is such a useless activity, right? Because in the end, the proof is a sequence of 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 3 is 5, that's what a, a, a full fledged mathematical proof will look like. All right, so anybody can read and understand mathematics written out in sufficient detail. It's just that even simple mathematical theorems become extremely long. Right? For example, the Pythagorean theorem, if you write a computer verify a proof is about 100 gigabytes or so. Right? But you have to first say what do you mean by real numbers in terms of integers and so on and so forth, it becomes extremely long. Right? And what is the difficulty of mathematics is the taxes of patience to read it. Right? So reading mathematics is a very trivial activity. Okay, as long as you understand how every definition corresponds to integers is critical. That's just in the big dictionary. All part of mathematics is two and two sets are equal. You know, I say the set of numbers is possibly the same as set of numbers and some other property. Two is equal to become difficult because some of the sets are infinitely big. So to prove two integers are the same requires a lot of work, right? Two, if I say the set of all integers at the same cardinal of even integers, in first blush it seems like terribly hard if I have to check every guy in this set as I'm made in this set and the instant minute enough to finish the proof. So it requires some cleverness. And sometimes cleverness succeeds in mathematics because of the pattern of the numbers. Right? So there's all there is to mathematics. If you're talking about a finite collection of integers, we check every one of them by group form. We have a little program that goes over every little number in the set, verify the properties too. The set is infinitely big, you have to find a pattern. Sometimes the pattern is obvious, sometimes it takes a lot of work. Okay? That's it. And every program, because you only consider you only dealing with integers, every proof, every segment of mathematics can begin as a computer program. Some computer programs, some proofs that we write on when you this computer program might take an infinite amount of time to run, but we don't care. Okay, there's one thing that a mathematician has is plenty of time to run these programs. Okay, so remember this is also very important. So proofs are actually programs. 
So every time you ask me, did I prove something correctly? You should ask yourself, so where was the program? Would it do what I was supposed to do? Okay, so there cannot be, when you finish a proof, you cannot have any ambiguity in your mind that I get the right proof or not. Okay, hopefully that never arises to you. So if I, I never give an answer to my question because of that. If you're going to believe proof is right, then you have some problems already. Right? If you have a doubt that the proof is right, that means the proof is wrong. So you don't finish proving it, that means. Alright? So the last final thing I'll tell you is this, that many times people tell me that it's an obvious proof that I don't need to prove. So if it's only so obvious, I don't need to prove it to you. Right? But my counter question would be, if it's so obvious to you, well, there should be a short proof for it. It should be giving me a short proof. So, but more practically, why does it question arise in your mind. Sometimes you tell this is so obvious, I don't see why mathematicians want to prove this. I just say, why is, for example, integer multiplication left distribution? Why, is this, why does this require proof? Right? Usually when this question arises, it's good to know when it arises in your head, it means that you need to have two definitions in your head. Okay, in one definition, you have some physical interpretation of what these things are, and then of course the definition in mathematics. So in mathematical definition, you can only name integers and sets of integers. That's all you're allowed to do. So in mathematics, when I ask you to prove that, I'm saying prove it over these definitions that I already have. Okay, for example, the simple thing would be like, you know, if I give you this equation for, you know, a world moving in a gravitational field, and I have to ask you, okay, the world is over here, the angle is 45 degrees, prove that there's a certain time at which the world will be the Move is over all this. Because you can see the ball moving in your head, so it's going to drop below the height of the start eventually. But of course, mathematically, what I'm saying is that should the solution to differential equation bring them to become negative. Right? These are two different things, and in your head, you don't want to conflate these two. Okay, so in this class, try to make sure when I, that when you give a definition, the definition is over down to integers in your head. Okay, don't look at definitions that come from a physical world in your head. Okay, which is almost no reason in the mean algebra class for that to happen, but occasionally it will happen, especially when we talk about geometry. And be very, very careful. Whenever you feel that something is obvious, but you cannot prove it, that means you have two definitions. Okay, you can inject one definition from your head. All right. So that's all the overall thing. So just prove everything and try to make sure that you think in terms of integers, and you should be fine. All right. So now, what is this class about? So this class is about uh, two questions. And the solution of these equations. Okay, so why do we care about this so much? Right, well, mostly because as engineers, you know, we try to build a machine or model something. Uh, machines are too complicated to build straight away, and we would like some help, like how we should be going to behave after we finish building it, and we depend upon physics to do all these equations. Okay, sometimes we also build ad hoc models, we'll come to that later on. Right, but in physics, unfortunately, these Models don't tell us explicitly what will happen, right? If I ask well, what is the trajectory of this eraser, the model is not telling what the trajectory is. It just tells you the measure the position, the velocity, the acceleration, or everything about the physical body. Then there's some equations you can write down relating all these quantities, and if you can solve these equations, you can figure out what's going to happen to the eraser, right? Solving equations becomes a big part of engineering because the way it's a you know, for whatever reason, we don't know why. Right, so solving equations is a big thing. So the question is, how do we solve these equations? And of course, in the modern age, you want to depend upon computers to do as much of the solving as we can. Right, and in particular, we want to automate as much of this mathematics as possible. Okay, so that's what the goal of this class is. Now, of course, if you just look at, you know, arbitrary equations, it might be too difficult to do. Right? You know, sine x, x squared plus y squared, Plus minimum of x comma y is equal to 2, and y squared minus 3x cubed is equal to 7 or something like that. It might be extremely difficult to attack an equation like this. Right? It's just too complicated. The set of positive equations, the state of the art, the non trans functions, it's just too hard to attack straight away. So over time, that's my answer. This is a thing. It's better to attack these equations in a like a systematic way. And among them, the simplest ones would be the linear equations. So you start with linear equations, and even within linear equations, we usually split into two classes. So within linear equations, split, uh, split up those that have finite number of equations and unknowns, and then an infinite number of equations and unknowns. And usually once you understand these two classes extremely well, then the rest of it is usually some 
question for combination of this. These men were not in equation set for after that. So that's how modern thinking is as far as attacking equation stuff. Okay? So the, the most uh, well understood of these two classes, the linear equation, both the finite and the infinite. Among these, the finite equations are considered pretty much a closed subject, and we understand theoretically how to solve them very well. But in practice, when it comes to designing algorithms that can solve these tasks, it can still be uh, full of open problems. Okay, so for example, in, in an average engineering problem, a billion equations, a billion unknowns would not be uncommon at all. It would back it be even too little in some ways. Right? But solving these equations, even in modern supercomputers, is extremely difficult. And there are lots of open questions about how to do this faster. When we're doing infinite equations, the theory is not as strong anymore, and you have to sort of do bits and pieces. So, if the, in, the, so in the class, I'm dividing it into roughly you know, a third of the time here and about two thirds of the time over there. So, infinite equations all run into like, you know, you can ordinary difference in equation, or recurrence equation, integral equation, partial differential equation, macro equation, they're all infinite linear equations. What you normally call the simple equations are just infinite linear equations in this class. Right? So, there the theory is not very strong, and we talk about why it's not so strong. So, you pretty much attack it piecemeal. And of course, once you go to nonlinear equations, then you know, all hell breaks loose. Every nonlinear equation is speaks independently on its own. But the ideas are drawn from these two classes. Okay? So, this is roughly the picture that we will follow. And then roughly our goal. Alright, so now <coughs> how are we going to attack this in this class? So in the beginning was was concentrated only on this one. So that one is hard enough, so we'll concentrate on the finite number of equations. And then once you grasp on that, we will then slide over there. So what do you mean by finite linear equations? So you all have seen the before in undergraduate class, we'll just do a quick review. So for example, if I look at the equation 2x is equal to 6, then here x is equal to the unknown, this is the one, and you know how to solve it, you do one, multiply both sides by one half. So you get x is equal to one half times six, which is two. So you get it. So that's one equation one I know. In this class, if you're interested in more general cases like this, for example, I would be interested in equation to say two x to three y minus is equal to ten, and so eleven x minus twelve y plus thirteen z is equal to say twenty two. So you see here we have two linear equations. You have to count the equations are two of them, so two equal signs, and I have three unknowns. Okay, x, y, and z. Okay, so one thing is important in this class, we're not so interested in square equations, where the number of equations might be unknowns. Even though for many engineers, that's the only case that they know of. Okay, in practice, in engineering, it's sort of low when you get a square equation. Dependence on square equations actually is, I don't know why, but it's really bad, okay? If, if, if greater than the number of models you can use, and most of the time, engineering, you can never get a square equation. Why? Because unlike physics people, when you're building a, a machine that interacts with the outside world, we know something about the machine, not everything, and we know nothing about the outside world. So you can never get a complete set of equations. Right? Even for the building, for example, it's a fairly simple machine, you just have to stand still and not fall, fall down. But if I ask what's in the machine on the blackboard, I don't know. Right? There's some cool idea of what is there, but we don't know anything about it. So for us, we will always be underdetermined in the sense that we never know enough about our machines, right? And, and we will never know enough about the equation that is satisfied. So you can go both ways. You can get more equations than unknowns or more equations than, or more unknowns than equations. And in this class, we will attack both. And of course, even in physics, when you know everything, you can still get equations that are not square, right? The maximum equation is a famous one. You have six unknowns, right? You have a record field and magnetic field at every point in space and time. So there are six numbers that are unknown at every point in space and time, but you have eight equations. Why? So it's a famous case of being non-square. So it is not that there's something funny about non-square equations, it's just that takes a little bit more elbow grease to deal with it. So in this class, from the get-go, the square equation will show up now and then, but our goal is not to worry about whether it's square or not. It's a little bit equation in general, because we have maximum flexibility in practice. Now, one more thing I should say is that when we, as we go to this class, you know, even though I will not ask you to do any programming assignments, especially in the beginning for people who are not used to abstract mathematics, uh, it's a good idea to have some high-level programming language as a crutch that you can lean on. 
So you can say, oh, if I learn from it, if I can't call this problem up, then I don't understand. Okay, that's always the case in mathematics. So, what is a good language to use? I would suggest OCaml. Anything from the ML family will be good, but I would suggest you learn OCaml. Because in OCaml, at least the, the level of that of uh, algebra and mathematics. Okay, so whatever uh, abstraction we as in mathematics has a one to one map inside OCaml. You can look at um, uh, language that have higher levels of abstraction as needed. For example, you can look at Haskell. But because it's even more abstract than OCaml, and to make the language a little bit harder for people to use in real life, um, there are even higher levels of abstraction possible. You can go up to APS, you can go to COP, and Isabel, and so on, like that. But my feeling is that these higher level languages are better if you already have some understanding of OCaml. And there are good tutorials in OCaml. There's also a good book by Paulson. Uh, I think it's called ML for the working programmer. Okay, but anyway, you should, if you really want to be able to write code that matches your code, you cannot do it in C++ or Java, but if you get very close to doing it in either OCaml or Haskell, one of the higher level languages, okay, you should be able to write code that exactly mimics your code. Okay, so you should become familiar with one of your higher level languages. It's a good idea. All right, so now let's work, work on that actually doing the mathematics. Now, how are we going to attack these linear questions? So, I'm going to not just look at the questions, but things beyond the question. For example, once we understand how to solve the questions, I also want to ask what happens as a solution if I change one of these numbers. Right? If I change two to one, how much does the solution change? Right? And I'm going to ask you like awkward questions to like myself. What happens? If I want to pick this number such that this has a solution for the number 11 and 37, right? So in engineering, we're doing design, later on the question will come backwards. So we want to say find x at a x equal to b, but we'll say find a such that x has certain properties. So we also want to, be, we want to go backwards in there. We want to design the change so that we don't know what the equations are, we're designing the equations themselves. So we also want to be able to go backwards. So because of all these complicated things, you take out an elaborate approach to solving these equations. Okay, so if you just want to solve linear things, then the answer is because it's too Right? And I'm assuming that all of you have done this in, in your undergraduate class, but this is the most important thing that you should know. Okay, so if you have forgotten what class animation is, you should go back, read up, or you want better do it yourself. Okay, figure out how to solve this one by hand without any linear algebra or anything like this class. Here you go. And it's absolutely the fundamental, um, the most important aspect of uh, mathematics. And at one point, 99% of computers, supercomputers are uh, just running this one piece of code. Right? It is, it is, it's all, most of them are proved in mathematics is hard. It can be traced to the fact that somewhere you do that simulation. Okay, if you look at a uh, machine design problem, many times when something is hard in design, it's because you do that simulation. Right. If you've heard of thought uh, equivalent or not equivalent circuits, then that's all gas in motion. One of you know the three on the phone, nightmare is trying Right, so you will get used to this. I will say repeatedly, whenever there's a hard part in the proof, I will say to you that I can eventually chisel the proof down to just doing gas in motion. Okay, so you should be very, very, very comfortable with it. Okay. All right, so how are we going to solve these things? The way we're going to look at these equations is to just Notation called matrix. Okay, so this notation is a way to crystallize how about two centuries of mathematicians have looked at equations and solved them. Okay, so it makes the new engineers able to do very complicated calculations. That's the idea. At one point, in, especially in the US and in Europe, around the, like the 1920s, Backlash against teaching linear algebra in universities because they felt that, well, you know, it's just notation, why bother? But nowadays, with the advent of we want a connotation where we express our problems and have the same piece of code, match with an answer on an obvious slope, answer on the elasticity question. It's better to have a common notation so don't keep repeating the code and everybody can understand what the code does. So now, many solutions pretty much the lingua franca among engineers and applied mathematicians, though it has some deficiencies, especially in the infinite setting which makes its use of pure mathematics much more restrictive. Okay, so I'll talk about this as we follow. So, 
What is the matrix? Okay, so our goal is to express problems like this in matrix notation first. So first I should tell you what the notation is. So when I teach notation, this is the second class for most of you, I will not give any physical analogies for this. And like I said, so I think it's bad habit to do that. And I see a matrix for me is just the annular array of numbers. Okay, when I say numbers in this class, we only care about real or complex numbers. Okay, we will not use anything else. So numbers that are both real and complex numbers can be defined all the way from into years, and you should go away after this class and spend a good half an hour thinking about how you're going to do that. Okay, make sure you understand the steps you would take to go from into years defining real numbers and complex numbers. Okay, it's a good idea to go in between through. You know, uh, rational numbers, you know, like two thirds is just a rectangular array of two numbers, two and three, or that. Okay, so make sure that we're able to, we're dealing with numbers, we're able to see all the way down to the integer level. That's important. Okay, so you, I think still the best way to think about this is thinking of a computer program, right? You know, you have a raw machine that has just two bits in it, right? This one has zeros and ones, there's only two integer bits. How, how do you represent everything else on the machine? We usually give you enough uh, low level thinking to survive in this class. Okay? But in this class, we're going to deal with the real number, complex numbers, that's something that you and I are familiar with. For most of the class, until we reach the very end, when I talk about infinite equations, we'll be able to survive just with the real numbers. Eventually, I will need complex numbers. Okay? So you have some time to survive with a complex number, you have time now to type that complex So, first, we did this rectangular array of numbers. And for example, so an example would be, for example, I say A is a matrix to be 3, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, Okay, well, this is a rectangular array of numbers. And I would say that this matrix has three rows and four columns, and then the three by four. Okay, and if I want to talk about the number, then you just put A is in the second row, the third column, so I say A, 2, 3 is equal to A. Okay, so that's the relation we use. And what the goal is, of course, is to use matrices to represent equations like this, but in particular, we are capable to represent equations like extremely large. You think about a billion equations, you know, and 300 unknowns. Right, so we are thinking about big objects, really, and that's what the relation that will be used for. Of course, you can see that the array thing is all the easier to do with the programming language, okay, so that makes it nice. So, when we work with equations, our goal will be to say, well, okay, we want to have a very large equation, like for example, like this one, as if it was an equation like that. Okay, so maybe we set up like that. This equation can be as a matrix times another matrix equal to some other matrix. Okay, so all these things will be matrices. That's where we want to go. And we want this notation to look like you're working with single numbers. We want A to behave like a chip. We want all the unknown numbers in this matrix to behave like the single number x. We want all these numbers here to behave like number 6. Okay, so in other words, we want to be able to add these numbers, multiply, divide by these numbers, and so on and so forth. And if our wish goes, I would put an x should look like b divided by b. Okay, that's what we want, roughly. Okay, now this is all just notational gymnastics. Okay, so just to make a very messy process, these are usable in practice by mere engineers. Okay, that's like the way I, I can better describe it. So if you want to just ease our way, take a very complicated problem with a complicated Fortran code or a simple first code, and have a simple way to think about it. Okay, the notation is supposed to get us there. And then we'll use notation exclusively for answering more complicated questions like that. Okay, but that's the goal. Alright, so how are we going to do this? So we want to think of matrices as numbers. Okay, roughly in our head, that's what we want to do. So we just analogy to how I'm going to make future definitions. And it's, of course, mathematics. Right, so to do that, I need to do arithmetic first on numbers, right? We work with numbers, the first thing we do is we want the way to do arithmetic. So we need to do define plus, minus, multiplication, and division. That is a full based arithmetic operation. If we do all this just right, hopefully, in the end of the day, we'll get so many equations as a nice bonus. It looks very trivial at the end. Yeah, that's the goal. Right, so you want to jiggle this just to get to the end up over there. Alright, so that's how people do this. Okay, so now we start with the easy ones. The thing is, you know, why is this certain definition now to match that? But, in and out, we should become obvious. Okay. 
So there are two matrices. Well, how do we want to add them? You can think of many ways of adding them. But the one that works best for linear coefficient is just to say that when I add two matrices, they must be the same size and shape. And when I add them up, I add them up component by component. Okay, so we just go like that. C plus B plus C plus one B plus one. Okay, so in particular, we don't allow you to add matrices that are different sizes. You can't add a two by three to a three by four, for example. Okay, so it's not really useful. Not there's some big mathematical truth behind it. This is convenient. This lesson is good enough. And it works pretty good for what we want to do. Remember, when for mathematical theories, it's just like now you're designing an API for computer. Same one with Google, make windows with buttons and mouses and right? so you have to. So I've already that okay, the code is in where now open window close, window, back button, things like that, right? So mathematics is exactly like that. Right? The convenient definition of infinite quantity that are useful by a lot of people. If you don't like them, throw them out and come with something else. Alright, they have no like they're not written by God or something like that. Right? Just another API. You know, some people are cute, some people are like gnome, doesn't matter. Okay, sometimes you get the job done. The key idea behind is what matters. Okay, so these these things are not some of the last thing. No, I'm not telling you something about this addition uh, that is make it so oh, this is the right way. Why why do I just treat that A for example? Right? I mean for some people that might be the better definition. Right? So it's not unthinkable for those kind of definitions. And later I'll tell you why actually these definitions are not that good actually. Okay? But for now we'll just ignore it. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do rather than defining minus. So one thing that we want to remember these definitions are made to make sure you do arithmetic. So we want to make it look as much as real numbers as possible. Okay. So one of the things you know like these operators satisfy something that we have to think like the left distributive law and the right distributive law and things like that. So we want as many of these laws to be true because that's what they're calling this operation plus, right? And that's called the gobbledy group instead, right? We want us to you know, think of not one thing as adding real numbers or adding into this. They want to behave similarly. So people are going to sort of, sort of get excited to make these definitions match up because of that. Right? So the next definition to define mind, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find something called scalar multiplication. So that those laws will match up a little bit better. So scalar multiplication says that if I want to multiply a matrix by a single number to its base, then I'm going to define this to be just a part of twice multiplication. So I'm going to say 2 times 5, 2 times something like that. And it's a size matrix. Right? And you're allowed to write this two bit to the left or to the right. We don't care where you write it. Right now, we'll see that this is ordering is important, but for scalar multiplication, we don't care. Okay? So then, subtraction has to be defined a bit carefully. We define subtraction to monitor the mimic of the other rules. So one of the rules that we know in for numbers is that if I add any number, I get back to number. Right? And that zero is then useful for defining the negative numbers. If I come with two minus two, we first start so, right? so that's why the zero is important. So for me, this is what is the analog, right? It's easy to see from this rule that the zero matrix, we're going to define the zero matrix, or the matrix with also zero in it. So A is a two by three matrix, one, two, three, four, five, six. So the zero must be all zeros in it, like that. Now, within the electrical community, the zero entities are just going to be ordinary zero. The engineers don't say what well, the size of the zero is because it's apparent from the matrix sitting next to it. If this A is 2 by 3, this has to be 2 by 3. If this is 4 by 5, it has to be 4 by 5. Three. So it's obvious from the guy next to what it has to do, but that is not common in all communities for various reasons. A physicist guy that is 0 to 2 by 2. Right? In the worst case, they will drop the 2 by 3 and put 2 by 3. Okay, but the medical engineers don't, and the textbook and the notes, I don't either. I just put a 0 over there. Sometimes it's, it's a scalar 0, just an ordinary number, and it's a matrix. Because you have to be careful when you read those questions. You know, is what. Right, so that's a plus 0, right? And then to define the matrix, going in front of have have this property. So we will just mimic that and we'll say the minus one times already defined the scalar multiplication, right? It says we define we multiply every number by minus one. So we already define scalar multiplication, but that is cast in stone. And now you can check easily that a minus a is the same as a 
plus minus one times x. Right, so that follows. So that satisfies all the rule that we need between the minus of a and minus one times a. And then we can define a minus b to be a plus minus one times b. And if you look at the entry by entry, so one more notation, if I, when I look at the matrix A, then if I call this row the i -th row and this column the jth column, then I will call this number here say i comma j. Right, so therefore if I look at A minus B, and I look at the i gate entry, I'm saying it's just the i gate entry of A minus the i gate entry of A. So this component by subtraction. Okay, so addition and subtraction, uh, you know, to remember the rule, is that you do component wise, you have to make sure that you have the same size and shape before you start. Now, if you're done, you end up the same size and shape, right? And you should record all of this. Okay, so those are the two easy ones. It's not clear why we define it this way, but it works reasonably well. Okay. Now, next comes the hard one, multiplication. Now, remember that for integer arithmetic, right, so we wanted to find a times b now. So this is the hardest, the big one. Okay, so remember when you define multiplication in other cases, like for example, you can do two fractions, for example, right? So if you want to multiply two times times three, then you have a rule for it, right? So of course, you know, this two over three is just you know, the train to think of that and easily. You also think of it as just a pain being multiplied like that. That's why it makes all the time. The computer program will store two and three as two variables or two entries in an array or a struct or something like that. So this is what's going on. I have some rule. In this case, it's fairly easy. You just multiply this point once. That's the rule. Right? But for complex numbers, that's not the rule. I'm we're multiplying two complex numbers, two plus three i and four plus five i. Right? The rule is much more nasty, right? The pair two three multiplied with the pair four five. The rule looks horrible, right? It's so like this two times four minus three times five, and then plus three times five plus three times four times five, right? So there's uh, multiplying some weird numbers to get something like that guy, and then there's a minus sign, right? So you have know, some sort of elaborate physical picture in your head that motivates this multiplication. Really, it's quite arbitrary. Right? Uh, you are talking about multiplying, you decided to be adding and subtracting numbers, and that's a good reason for doing it because then it behaves nicely. Okay. Right? There's some mumbo jumbo going in there. Yeah. So, when we do get a multiplication, we start to go. Right? Partially, the goal is already known to you. Right? The most unique uh, system to the questions. But actually, there's a bigger goal we want to achieve. Okay? The, the big goal is called a uh, meta. Theorem, okay, there's not actually a theorem, but it's sort of like the spirit of the, the definition is this. We want to be able to represent every linear operator that we know of at the matrix. Okay, so this is what is the actual goal of the matrix. Every linear operator that you can think about should be writable as a matrix. So what is a linear operator you know, right? Integrating the linear operator, differentiation of the linear operator, conversion of the linear operator. The plus terms of the linear operator, full terms of the linear operator, solving the series of the linear operator. Right? You want to take all of those guys, right? They must make it. Okay, and this is the real reason why linear algebra or matrix algebra is So the entire spot of linear operator is available as a rectangular array of numbers. And application of a linear operator is to be made possible. Right? So if I give you a linear operator, if I give you integration, you can go to max. F of S D S, right? So this is a linear operator that takes a function which returns another function. From a linear algebra point of view, it's taking a column of numbers, right? A function just a long column of numbers, and you put all the function values in big stack. Taking a matrix with infinite many rows in one column, and it's giving you another function back, which is just a long column with all those numbers stacked, right? And in the X, you get different numbers that are integrated. So you're having a function to a function, it's a linear operator. Linear in the sense that if I say integral d of x, alpha has what d of s, d s, will be integral 0 to x, f plus integral 0 to x, g, and f. The sense of the normal process is being a linear operator. We don't care about it in this part, right? What we're saying is that this operator should be writable as a matrix, and the action of applying the operator should be made it very complicated. Okay, so I should be able to write this thing as some big matrix here, 
and all the numbers are left in there. That's something, and I should be able to get a comment that all these things in it. That's all we need. Alright, you can get a, a concrete numerical representation of all the linear operators. Okay, so whatever definitely becomes a formative property is going to be fairly complicated because it was going to get the whole possible linear operator that we can think of. Right? And the advantage of so you get a complicated definition, but then you get a lot of simplicity, right? Everything is a matrix now, and you can do everything with MATLAB. Alright? So you should have to train yourself now so whenever you go back to your old underneath that means okay, this is a linear operator have a matrix. Okay, what is the matrix okay, you should Convert everything back to the so You can see how it's happening now. You can all these codes I have. I want to think about them. I can understand where they were positioned, what are all the population, what is this sensitivity, and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's just the meta thing I'm going to take care of. Okay, and so because of that, everybody is going to be complicated. Just like this was getting complicated. All right, so what is this definition of the content that we're going to use? Okay, so meta is a bit weird, so we we'll write it down. So write it down in your case. And this word takes a while to get used to, but it's word spec. Okay? It goes without saying, you can multiply matrices in your head, you have a multiple time in this class. Okay? So do 100 multiple until this rule is sort of like activity of brain. So you, you can multiply. Let's see this thing in Okay. So you can multiply matrices of different size now, but there's a constraint now. Okay, you see the whole three rectangles I drew are three different sizes. Unlike addition or subtraction, which went before, where they all the same size, maybe by the way, deliberately has a mix. Okay, well, let's say that this uh, has n rows and this has n columns. Then it's required that this matrix has n rows, but it cannot have k columns. Let's say. Okay, so this is n by n, and this is n by k, and then the product will have n rows. And k column. And you see that if you look at the product, you cannot tell what was the number of columns in the question. So on that information. Okay, so this is the first constraint on matrix multiplication. The three, the three matrices must satisfy the shape of which undefined. Okay, what is in particular? You cannot multiply a two by three matrix by another two by three matrix. You can add them, but you cannot multiply them. Okay, so because of this you will have all kinds of headaches when you work with matrix algebra, unlike numbers, you can freely multiply the word and product. It does not allow. Second thing is that so there are numbers here and the numbers here you need to compute the numbers here. Okay? So given the matrix A and B, how do I define this matrix C? Okay? Because here's a definition. You want to come with one, you want to come with one that satisfies capable of satisfying this meta here. Okay, and with much sitting around, you can finally figure out that the right combination is like this. Suppose I want to compute the number in the third row and in the fourth column. I want to find this number in C. I will define how is that number. Remember, there are m times k numbers over here. So I must give a formula for all of them. Okay, well, I click tell that the formula is pretty much the same for everybody. So I just say what is the number in the third row and fourth column. To do that, you have to take the third row from here. Okay, so take the third from here. Let's skip plus two. And then you must pick the fourth column from here. Okay, let's pick the first three columns. And then it turns out that the rule for computing this number is just multiplying this row times this column, patterns of two matrices, five times six. Okay, so let's write it on the side. So to find the three column four number on the right hand side, definitely requires that I multiply this row times a column. So I need to multiply a row times a column, and you can see that I have to do this for every entry, so it's a very common operation. So it's given a name, it's called the product. Okay, there is some misuse of terminology between the algebraists and the analysts. They call this inner product, but they won't be even happy with that terminology, but anyway, they're roughly the same thing. So the third row, right, has n numbers, okay? Let's call them A11, A12, A1, A1, A1. Remember that N, this is the entire slice, right? It's got this one, those are N numbers in it. My, oh, sorry. My, the way I number them, step on the third row, the 1, A2, A3, 3, okay, A3, A. And then I multiply with this column. There's a fourth column of B, with B, 1, 4, B, B, 3, 4, like that, to B and 4. 
can bring us many complications. Right? So, middleware is extremely powerful because of that. But however, if you go to your function app, you'll never see the word native extension at all. Right? But function app is just linear algebra of infinite dimensional matrices, but how come we never use the word native if it's about infinite dimensional matrices, right? The reason is because this property is not true for infinite dimensional matrices. In general, native multiplication of infinite dimensional matrices is not associated. Okay, so the community splits in two where the solution comes. Engineers, because they're so used to MATLAB and things like that, we continue to use matrix notation in the interdimensional setting, such as this is called the topless matrix, for example. Every engineer has heard of it. But even though mathematics would be the word topless matrix, those people the word topless operator and not write down that matrix. Now, of course, the mathematicians are right because you actually cannot remove the matrix in the case of interdimensional matrices. So in particular, even something like this is not allowed. It's meaningless in this class. Right? Because if I have to tell them if I have A times A times A times A, then this product might be different from this product. Now wait a second. Okay, so when is that here? Okay, so the so-called non-associated algebra. So in mathematics, people study non-associated algebra as a separate class by themselves. But the best example of an analysis algebra is just the infinite dimensional of native algebra. It's generally not a good thing. Because of this barrier, most mathematics was not even a physical solution because kind of a waste of time. However, in practice, you know, when a mathematics can close block the time of, like you say, even mathematicians will think of infinite dimensional matrix as ordinary matrices. So we just stop it like this. We do the calculation, ignoring the fact that it cannot be associated. When it comes back to actually write the page so we go back to all the calculations without negative notation. Okay, because then we'll be more careful about our job and so this is very important, okay? So this rule, the one that's the most important, right, which allows things like any power of page to and goes away if you made it into the dimension. Okay, and of course the second part of the class will talk about infinite dimensional systems, so we'll go back to the infinite dimension. So a big chunk of the machinery will just go away along with the lack of association. I right, see many engineering papers using interdimensional matrices and writing things like this. Okay, of course, it's right and wrong. This is why the mathematics don't need the notation. It's just nonsense, okay? So we're getting really careful about this. Alright, so <clears throat> matrix there's a little bit of almost all the problems you care about. Right? But there's still one key problem that we should talk about, which is now, for the multiplication, we can say what is matrix inversion, right? What does it mean to divide two matrices? The shell is where it becomes a longer story now. So, how can we divide two matrices? So, then we'll go back to what we're trying to do in the beginning. So, that's not a done. We're trying to solve equations, right? Suppose we have equation 4x plus 3y minus 3y is equal to 9, and 10x minus 13y plus 14 is equal to 22. Then we now see that this is an inner product, this is an inner product, right? You can see the pattern, you multiply two numbers, two numbers, and then adding them up, so that's the inner product. So we know we can convert this back to negative solution, right? Anytime you're multiplying adding numbers, you can see only, right? You look at combination, you're converting a single H with X, and this is H of N minus K, X of K, sum of over K, right? So multiplying an A, that's the way it's product, inner product, right? If I'm the analog sum that's ended into the map of k minus s, g of s, d s, g of infinity, to b h of t. Same thing again, right? You're multiplying two numbers and you're adding them up, right? Integration means just you're adding up. It's just a weight. If you have an uncountable sum, you're trying to add an uncountable number of integers, or any numbers, real numbers, only three possible numbers you can produce. This is 0 plus integer minus integer. Right? So we're talking about uncountable number of numbers, you can get that. So when we add uncountable number, we always weight it down somewhere. So we effectively put the countable set of numbers down. The most common way of doing that is by what's called integration. And there's many other ways, but this is just one way to do it. Right? So then it's just a modify to make it like very well in the uncountable set. But on the linear algebra purpose, this is just a sum step. Right? It's multiplying two numbers and adding them up. So this is also. Okay, if you declare in that, 
is this one is a little bit confusing here. I recommend looking at strength for that. Right? Or go back to a VMI and get a different one. Right? If you integrate from zero to one, f of x dx, then this is roughly the sum of f of i over n i is equal to zero to n minus one. Right? And you want to turn the one over. Right? The one over n, of course, is what we call dx. Right? And these are all the numbers we're adding. If you add them all enough, if you add up all the values of function, you're going to get either zero plus minus one. Those are the only two numbers you can do. Or nothing at all. You won't come Right? So what we're trying to say is that I look at the number at this point, and I think it's roughly this number will hold true for about this amount of time. So I'm taking a frequency weighted added to the number of these Because the raw sum will not converge. So if the raw sum does not converge, we'll take some kind of average to Right? We then try to add the number plus one, minus one, plus one, minus one, and you want to convert. So if you take like four.